here with Alex Balkin from CoinFund. Coin Alex, what do you do at CoinFund? So um, we started as an investment company um, researching <coughs> blockchain projects and cryptocurrencies and, <coughs> you know, um, and, and, and investing some of our, our friends and family money into them just kind of as a hobby. And it spun completely out of control um, when, uh, you know, we started realizing just how powerful these things are. You know, we're, we're technologists by education, so, um, so we really approached the topic of understanding blockchain projects from sort of very low level. Um, you know, when, until there became too many projects, we even, like, went to GitHub and read code to understand whether people were doing the right thing. Um, um, and so we, we did well. Um, we then, um, people started asking us for advice over time, and we, uh, in fact, started working with a number of big clients <coughs> that are kind of late-stage startups and client uh, companies with uh, established user bases that are looking at blockchain-based business models. Um, so we also became an advisory company. And... <coughs> I see this as a <clears throat> particularly good con combination because as an investor we look at projects from some direction where we can also bring value as an advisor because we're also an mm -hmm. investor. Um, so that's what we do. We're, we're an investment company and an advisory company. And what would you say your role is in, in furthering the blockchain technology ecosystem? Ooh, what a lovely if anything. question! No, uh, um, no, um, it's 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 a lot. It's um, it's a couple of things. Um, um, a particular blockchain project usually, <coughs> very rarely, has the breadth of the view of what's possible, of what's happening, of what's happening where, and so we're trying to hold kind of the big picture in mind. Um, if with respect to the investment activity, for example, you want to look at <coughs> projects from verticals that are notably missing in the space. So you know what's, you know the verticals that are being covered, and you know the verticals that are that are missing. You also understand um, the 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 spread of technologies. You understand, um, well, it's not right to say that you understand the regulation, but you understand things that people don't understand about regulation. Mm -hmm. Um, and so um, we are, um, you know, trying to enable the space to function in a, in a responsible way in many cases. For example, if you take our uh, Slack community, which started very early on and became one of the major research sources of information for people in the blockchain space, um, you know, there's a constant presence of people on our Slack community that talk to founders uh, and, and tell them to be responsible in many ways. Like, for example, if you look at Tezos, um, you know, Tezos opened a channel in our Slack community and then everybody was telling them, look, be more responsible. You can't have an uncapped a ICO. It's wrong. And your investors are going to get hurt and bad things are going to happen. And People in our Slack community got completely ignored by by Tezos founders, and look look what's happening. Mm -hmm. So so we really try to 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 bring and instill kind of like good quality thinking in many ways, technology, um, uh, sort of regulation, social um, investor responsibility, user responsibility. Uh, financial responsibility of these projects. Okay. So today we've also heard the term blockchain economics mentioned a couple of times. Um, what does that entail, according to you? So, um, it's it's a um, so so crypto blockchain economics or crypto economics is. Um, a word that um, kind of names the thinking around uh, value-enabled digital assets, right? 
Um, and, and so whenever you have a a, a, an object of value in a digital space created by blockchain, um, it becomes a subject of crypto economics, and, and there's certain differences for why crypto economics is distinct from traditional economics. Mm -hmm. It's not too distinct, but there are clear distinctions. Could you name that, one? That, for example, come from the fact that um, digital assets on, on blockchain uh, in some ways uh, are able to police themselves. Whereas with the real world money, that's not true. There's always people who have to police other people. Right? Um, and by police, I mean basically ensure correctness and um, ensure that obligations are fulfilled, as I was saying in my talk. Um, so, so a lot of what previously would have to be done by people can now be done by technology. Um, and that's a really important aspect of crypto economics because then technology enables you to create structures of fairly arbitrary complexity uh, with respect to how value moves and what it gets associated with. And it's almost like, what's the, I wonder if I can have like a good comparison. Um, so, you know how people so, so in, in, in psychology, for example, or in um, um, neural science, mm -hmm. there was a kind of thinking that was very much affected when artificial neural networks came about. Mm -hmm. You know, if you ever study artificial neural networks, you, you see a kind of a modeling system which kind of makes you think about what's possible in terms of thinking and, and intelligence in general. And blockchain is doing the same thing to economics. Uh, economics before blockchain, of course, was in many ways designed. But, but also, it was something that kind of happened to people. The invisible hands, maybe. Yeah, for most people, economics just kind of happens to you. You are born into it. Mm -hmm. And then somebody else is making the choices that affect your economic lives, right? And so you think of it as a given, like air or, you know, handshakes, right? Mm -hmm. But then when crypto economics comes about, you suddenly realize that um, you can now think of economics as something you can actually play with, mm -hmm. sort of in your garage, so to say, right? And in that respect, crypto economics is a super set of economics because given the ability of creating new economic components using blockchain-based systems, you suddenly get <clears throat> a design space which no economist has ever got, gotten a chance to play with. So that's kind of what I call crypto economics. Okay. Then maybe this follow-up question might be too simple, but um, there's been a lot of talk over the last couple of years in comparing blockchains like Bitcoin and Ethereum to distributed ledger technologies, where one of the distinctions could be whether or not the solution had a token in it. Is, are there, is there crypto economics without tokens? Um, <clears throat> that's a fascinating question. So first of all, there are two different questions, right? Because distributed ledger technology um, you mean, you mean, for example, like inter-organizational settlement systems, that type of for DLT? Instance, yeah. um, so, yeah, so, so let me just kind of, I hear two, two different questions in what you asked, and let me address them one by one. <coughs> First, is there crypto economics without tokens? Um, and I think the answer is kind of yes, but with the understanding that Economics doesn't necessarily have to be associated with um, with the transfer of value. Okay. Um, so, blockchain is one place where digital governance and digital economics start combining, and so you can have very interesting organizational structures that are not based on economic models, and I would call them crypto organizational mm -hmm. but in some sense they're crypto economic because because they're about 
basing a, a human collaborative structure on, on blockchain, right? Mm -hmm. On a blockchain system. Um, now, you mentioned DLT or digital ledger technology. Um, and this is a really fascinating topic because <clears throat> um, here's how I think about it. We start with centralized companies, right? It's basically like central control, humans ensure other humans behavior. Economics kind of enables this because you, you do achieve control over your employees because you're paying them salaries, right? And you can take take that away if somebody doesn't do what you want. So that's just very, very basic and kind of kind of um, primitive, right? Then on the opposite side of the spectrum, you see fully decentralized structures, which are permissionless public uh, systems like Bitcoin, for example, um, which do not have um, sort of any central control almost at all. You could argue about that, but, but, but that's the idea mm -hmm. at least, right? And, and they are in some sense very limited because um, you have to have things like recourse um, and you have to have things like governance and you have th to have things like upgradability mm -hmm. to um, al allow technology kind of to move in step with what it needs to actually do, right? And um, digital ledger technologies that, that coordinate various economic behaviors uh, sort of economic interactions between multiple organizations like an interbank settlement system on blockchain is a little bit more towards the centralized mm -hmm. end of the spectrum but but it's not um, fully centralized it kind of distributes control over what's happening between several interested parties who while being identified and and fully um, you know, fully responsible for their actions, the centralized side of the spectrum, right, um, are also taking joint responsibility and joint governance over what's happening in the system. And, and if you look at this as a spectrum, you will see that many different experiments are happening at different points in this spectrum. So, for example, if you take Sweetbridge, um, you know, Sweetbridge is a hybrid centralized, decentralized system. It's very much decentralized with, with respect to the cryptocurrency, mm -hmm. but it's also to some extent centralized with respect to, for example, identity and KYC AML. And it's um, you know, an experiment that is trying to find the right place in the centralized, mm -hmm. decentralized um, uh, spectrum. Now, why is decentralization so important? Why can't we just keep going with centralized models? Is because controls that, that are required to ensure that a centralized entity behaves correctly with respect to economic value are very expensive. And so you achieve significant optimization of your uh, money if you take some amount of power. And I'm not being libertarian here. I'm being very practical. Mm -hmm. If you take some amount of power away from, from a, some amount of agency, I should rather say, from a single individual or a single organization on this side of the spectrum, you actually end up with, an, with a significant increase of efficiency because some things just kind of happen without anybody having to, to ensure mm -hmm. that, right? Um, and so that's the question that's, that, that we are, as a space, are trying to answer. Is like, what are, the, what are the right balances between centralized and decentralized, where centralized gives you more freedom and decentralized gives you more assurances, uh, sort of with respect to every use case that we're trying to solve. You know, what's the best model for um, a, a social network? What's the best model for a bank? What's the best model for a um, supply chain company? What's the best model for a, um, you know, for a video streaming application, right? And they're all trying to find the right balance between centralized and decentralized. And it's actually philosophically really fascinating. It is. Let's look ahead a bit towards the next edition of the Blockchain Hackathon. Uh, how do you see the role of the Blockchain Hackathon within the blockchain technology ecosystem? Um, <clears throat> well, I, I really think that um, 
what I've seen here today in, 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 in this organization, interacting with everybody who's part of it, is I see a group of people that are really um, uh, committed to really high quality thinking. And, and I'm extremely pleased to see that. Um, and I think that uh, bringing new enthusiasm from young entrepreneurs and you know uh, experimenters while putting them in touch with people who understand what it means to be responsible, who understand the best practices, who can can mentor uh, them you know to the best of their ability is really powerful. Um, the, the interesting thing about the blockchain space is that there is more desire to do things than people who know how to do them. Um, so the more you create a community of people who know what they're doing, the better. Okay. What would your wish be for the outcome of the upcoming blockchain hackathon, if you could pick one? I think I think these kinds of events are uh, really strong community building exercises. Um, I think that a hackathon should demonstrate the power of collaborative thinking. Um, and to me, it's almost not that important the kinds of projects that win the hackathon as the experience of people who come sort of to work together um, in a, in a, you know, in a way that's, that's coming from the bottom rather than from the top. Okay. It's like... So, so, so just to kind of summarize that thought, I, I would love for young, or not so young, whatever, um, for, for enthusiastic people to experience results of their enthusiasm. Thank you.